Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to Suzette. Thank you for the organizers here at Olin Library. It's real, I'm really humbled that I have such a nice crowd of familiar faces here and some um, unfamiliar, which is great, especially in this time of the spring, especially with the nice weather outside. So thank you so much for coming. Um, thanks for being here to learn a little bit more about my book project. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what inspired me to write this book, what influenced me, because I think sometimes we have um, the final product in our hands and then it's not until the book actually comes out that you start to think about how it materialized into this. And so part of this for me has been after writing it, trying to understand what were the motivations and the inspirations and then how, uh, what, what later trajectories of research this book is going to enable for me. Um, so this book, Heaven, Hell, and Everything in Between, began as a doctoral dissertation, which is the case for many of us um, in, who were in PhD programs and then um, end up in faculty positions. So this is basically the culmination of a 10-year research project that began somewhere around 2007 um, and then came out into press in 2016. And I was a graduate student at the City University of New York Graduate Center. And um, one thing that really stuck with me that I realize now actually had a profound impact on this later research that I did were actually mural paintings in the city itself. Um, and in particular, the murals of East Harlem. Um, and I just show you a couple of um, images here on the screen to give you a bit of a visual. Um, I was a curatorial intern at a nonprofit arts organization in El Barrio called Art for Change. And so when I would go to do some of this work, I would always pass through, oh, is that feedback from my, oh, oh okay. Um, I would always pass by these murals and some of the guiding questions that I would ask myself when I would see them are, you know, what are the relationships between the between street art and community identity. How can we understand images of historical figures like La Reina Celia, Pedro Pietri, um, uh, Che Guevara, and others? Um, how can we understand the meanings of these images embedded in urban space? What does it mean to paint the contours of your community? And what is the type of viewership that these images elicit? And so even though my book is dealing with completely different material in a very different context, both temporally, geographically, and culturally, some of the same guiding principles around um, mural art, um, community space, and community memory still stuck with me as I was writing this book and conducting research for it. Um, another major kind of um, I guess impulse for me was that when I was doing seminar work in my, in my graduate courses, I was very much drawn to an understanding of colonial murals. I did my training in um, pre-Columbian and colonial Latin American art. But of course, all of that training is happening in a classroom in Midtown Manhattan in New York City. Um, and the only ways by which we're accessing these images is through PowerPoints. And I was, of course, paradoxically always interested in that which could not be captured in a book or in a PowerPoint, and that's site-specific art. And I remember the one um, seminar paper that kind of led me, oh wait, hold on a second, that led me into my dissertation project was um, this Molino de los Incas by the artist Tadeo Escalante. And there were three books that had various poor quality images of this mill. And I would do all these weird things like in PowerPoint trying to reconstruct the spaces. Um, I was also trying to figure out the interior space of another um, church, San Pablo de Cacha, which is located in Sicuani. So I would get various angles of the images and cut them out and repaste them and then hang them on the wall just to try to approximate 
what the bodily experience was of seeing these three-dimensional images. Because we oftentimes think about murals as epiphenomena of canvas paintings, but in fact, there's such a different type of experience involved in, in the viewership and the production of murals because they are embedded into architectonic space and by extension, community space and by extension, geographical locales. And so it really wasn't until I began my dissertation research that I realized what kind of visceral impact these murals really have. And I think that the number one experience for me was when um, I finally, you know, I tracked down a lot of the murals that I wanted to visit. And then when I entered into the churches, um, oftentimes it was completely different from what I had expected. Um, and so the very beginning of the book actually talks about this moment of, of, um, of just um, being so awed by the sanctity of the space and by the, the colors that I'm, you're enveloped in. And I have to say, even um, the best photographs that I was able to take, the best photographs that my friend Pilar was able to take, still don't quite capture it in a way that is going to approximate that um, experience. But at the very least, I tried. Um, and so a lot of the book is trying to look at questions around um, artistic production in the colonial period, looking at how, what's the interplay between European religious imagery and um, local artistic practices, and how artists are negotiating between imported European visual culture and the local aesthetics, local histories, and community um, uh, beliefs that they're also trying to convey. And so a lot of the questions around how we interpret the art of colonial Latin America often centers on issues of hybridity, looking at the hybridity between, let's say, European indigenous and African descended aesthetic systems and how they're kind of coalescing together. There's a lot of different words that have been thrown around, syncretism, cross-fertilization, and so on and so forth. Um, and those questions interest me, but what I also wanted to look at was trying to understand murals as um, alternative the, um, historical documents, um, trying to understand them as mechanisms for expressing um, the, that which cannot be expressed in words, and also looking at murals as visual tools um, and as visual languages that um, those who are denied access to the culture of letters are able to exercise. And so going beyond just questions of um, hybridity to ask, you know, what are some of the specific maneuvers that artists are making to make these images meaningful, both to themselves, to their patrons, and to their congregations. And so the book is centered on a number of different case studies. And I'm very much indebted to the important work that has already been carried out um, by a number of Peruvian and Bolivian art historians. Um, but what I was interested in doing is trying to uh, push the envelope a little bit to really understand where these images are coming from, how they came to be, what, why artists made the choices that they did. And um, so the very first case study, and um, you know, I'll just go through these very briefly, concerns um, the entrance wall mural at the Church of Andahuaylillas, which is located just outside of the city of Cusco. So all of the examples that I'm using um, are in the Cusco region of Peru, which of course was the former capital of the Inca Empire um, and remained and continued to remain, continues to remain a major center of um, indigenous and mestizo um, cultural and artistic production. And so this is where we see a lot of these very rich negotiations happening at the visual level. Um, so that my first obsession, and I really think about these chapters as, as obsessions too, because you just get so um, you know, focused on this one thing. And a lot of times, um, I'm sure as many of you know who have written books or who have engaged in this kind of research, um, you, sometimes the archives will lead you on a wild goose chase. You never know what you're going to find. Um, and so the wild goose chase that was involved in this particular mural, which 
to me is just so very striking. And just to give you a sense of the scale, um, I would say the wall is about as large as this wall that we see here and much taller. So we're talking about a really imposing large scale image. This is of uh, the entrance um, portal to the church. So this is the last uh, image that you would see upon exiting, showing the path to heaven and hell. Um, the path to heaven is covered in, uh, oh, I don't have my pointer, but covered in brambles and spines. The path to hell is covered in flowers, but culminates in a fiery castle and a hell mouth and is very medieval imagery. But I could not figure out what the source print was. And that's a big obsession for people who work in my field. What's the European source print? We can't figure anything out until we know the source print. And I was uh, obsessed and I could not find it and I just didn't know what to do with myself. But in the interim, I started to be, look into all these other archives and documentary sources. I was looking at references to the past to heaven and hell in um, priest manuals. I was looking at um, theatrical productions, such as um, Jose de, Val de Valdivieso's um, Alto Sacramentales, uh, which, help, which also um, touch on these themes. And I found out that a play that was very much associated with this very theme was performed in this area right around the time that these murals were produced. So I started to realize that there's a much larger conversation going on that goes far beyond just figuring out the source print. But I've, actually, I did find it. But I realized um, you know, that there are all these other sort of constellations of, um, of, of sources that, that these artists are drawing upon. And I say artists because murals were almost always communal affairs. So oftentimes, they're not signed. And part of the reason for this is because they were, there were multiple people who were working on them and creating them. So there's an, a historical mark left on the images themselves through the presence of multiple hands. And you can see different skill sets when you look really closely and start to inspect them. So that's chapter two. Um, another aspect of, of murals that I became interested in too were um, this phenomenon of textile murals. And this is just a small sort of snippet of a much larger mural program at the Chapel of Caninkunca. But there, another major kind of artistic or mural genre that we see are the interiors of churches painted um, in these very lush imitations of damasks and other types of fine fabrics. And I started to really question you know, why does this particular technique proliferate in this region? And it's not actually just exclusive to Cusco. We have e examples of textile murals throughout South America. Um, there's examples in Colombia, Ecuador, Chile, Argentina, Bolivia. Even um, some of the missions in New Mexico have a very similar kind of um, design scheme. And, but I was trying to figure out, you know, what are the larger meanings here? And I was able to also find examples of textiles that may have been at the disposal of artists, also helping us to get beyond that paradigm of all of these images are based on prints, which is a huge kind of um, uh, guiding principle that we use for our analysis of colonial art. And uh, also thinking about these the different ways that spaces are made sacred. Because when we think about the Andes in particular, we think about uh, what some scholars call textile primacy of the Andes, by which I mean um, textiles being the model for which other arts are informed, and textiles having such a sacred resonance um, from the pre-Columbian period up through the contemporary moment. What does it mean then to clothe a space with textiles? And uh, one of the most kind of amazing um, interiors, this is just another one at the Church of Okongate, um, and thinking about the, the models that were being used, like this chasuble or other types of examples that may have served as inspiration. Uh, but my favorite one here is of the Church of Kai Kai, uh, which was recently restored. So there is a little bit of con uh, 
intervention going on here that's, you know, these are much brighter than, than they may have actually been in reality. But it gives you a sense then of that experience of being almost in this tented space to be enveloped in cloth. Um, and so that's the subject of another chapter of the book. So each one is kind of looking at a different manifestation or evocation of, um, of, a, of a different mural aesthetic and how they all kind of connect to each other. Um, and then the last uh, chapter of the book, which I think was my favorite one to write, was looking also at the production of art in the aftermath of the Tupac Amaro Rebellion which was a major anti-colonial rebellion that took place in 1780 to 1781, um, in which the very uh, parishes that we're look of churches that we're looking at were directly implicated. And so the Church of Waro in particular, and I showed you the interior a few slides back, um, the community of Waro was very much um, ensconced in the rebellion. Tupac Amaro himself visited the church, as it was testified by a witness, um, and went through all of these kind of denunciations of colonial society, of the church, of all the corrupt individuals that inhabited the church and the, and the community, um, and the, you know, the corrupt uh, magistrates and the priests. And so the, f the very fact that the rebel himself was giving this damning indictment of not only the colonial system, but also the power structure of the Catholic Church in Latin America. Um, it really made me wonder, well, what role does art play then in the immediate aftermath in this moment of intense repression and censorship? So um, I'm not going to give away the book, but I have a whole series of hypotheses. This is another um, church that has very strikingly similar imagery um, where we see, you know, purgatory and a hell mouth, unfortunately, very badly damaged, but also but in Sikwani, another hotbed of revolt. And we're seeing perhaps then the patronage of this very violent, grotesque, medieval inspired art right in a moment where there is this um, push to try to suppress any kind of sedition against the colonial state. And so I try to hypothesize different ways that we can think about um, the visual arts and the ways that they are interacting with the historical moments in which they're conceived. Um, and so I know that we're running a little bit out of time, so um, I'll just skip forward really quickly. Here's just a couple of other images. Um, this, and then this, of course, is the cover of the book, as you may recognize. And this is the um, link for the MavCore site. And I don't, I'm not even going to try to figure out how to project this. So, um, but if you go to the University of Texas Press page where my book appears, there's a direct link. Because one of the sad um, you know, realities of book publishing is that it's a beautiful book, but the color plates, there's only 20 of them, and they're right in the middle of the book. I wasn't able to get a full color book, and there were hundreds of images that I would have liked to include that I couldn't. So this is kind of a digital supplement to the book that has a number of beautiful photographs that will help to sort of flesh it out because we're back to that original conundrum of not being able to see these things within their own space. So I, I, in some ways, I felt like I was reproducing the problem. So at, 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 to a certain extent, though, digital resources can be really helpful in ameliorating that issue. Um, and then I'll just show you a few more images of churches that are, were not included in the book, um, but can be the subject of future scholarly investigation. One thing that we tend to see that's really interesting, um, this is a church of San Cristobal de, de, de Rapaz um, in the Lima Highlands, is um, you start to see the appearance of really similar imagery across vast distances. A lot of times the story that we tell in art history is one where uh, power and artistic power flows from the center to the countryside. Um, this is a paradigm that we try to avoid, but always kind of remains ever present, especially when we're talking about the colonial situation. So thinking about Lima, Cusco, Bogota, as the, La Paz as these major cultural centers, which is true. 
But what I'm also noticing too is that there are these alternative routes of artistic dissemination. And a lot of these routes tend to follow um, commercial um, routes. They follow routes of pilgrimage. And this is something that I think could be the subject of a whole other book, is tracing the so-called popular aesthetic. Or how are, is it that at the Church of Rapaz, which is located hundreds of miles away from the church, um, sorry, these slides are going a little bit slow, of Parinacota, which is located in northern Chile, hundreds of miles away. I just had to show the alpaca <laughs> picture. Um, you know, how is it that we can find such interesting similarities in the color palette, in the style, in the type of iconography, in its location within these churches? Um, and it just makes me think more about how we can trace some of these movements of people, of materials, of styles and ideas across much larger distances than we often are able to um, embark on for a first book. So maybe this will be the next project. Um, I know that we're kind of running short on time, so I'll keep it at that, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So it's a great question. I'm just going to repeat it for the purposes of the recording. The question was, were these murals produced by local people or by priests who traveled? Um, the question of attribution is really difficult because so few of them were signed. And another one of my obsessions was trying to find artist contracts for these murals. And they virtually don't exist. And I think part of the reason for this is because this artistic practice was considered a very marginal type of act, visual or aesthetic activity at the time. There wasn't as much prestige accorded with, the, um, with mural painting. It didn't garner the same amount of prices. I do find names every once in a while. So for instance, um, the Waro murals, we have Tadeo Escalante as, we have the signature and there's also an archival reference. But for the vast, and then for Andahualias, we have Luis de Riano. Both of these individuals are mestizo, um, local community members, um, but come from, um, or sorry, excuse me, Riaños Creole, um, Escalantes Mestizo from Acomayo. So it, it kind of ranges. I think in a lot of the cases, the priests are the ones who select the imagery and the ones who commission the works, but by and large, they were being produced by local artists. Ernesto. It's a good question, um, and so this, so the question of um, subversion in the arts and, and being able to associate certain types of representations with identity, it gets really tricky because, um, because first of all, the nature of artistic training. So a lot of these artists um, who were of a range of different ethnicities, mestizo, indigenous, Afro-Peruvian, Creole, uh, we're all being trained within the same paradigms and dictates of the Catholic Church of naturalistic representation. And so sometimes it becomes very difficult to, to see resistance in a visual way. Um, and also the, that the resistance um, accommodation paradigm um, has been critiqued in, in, in by a lot of scholars as being very um, black and white and, and difficult to, and more an, a 21st century imposition onto the past rather than, um, an under, than the experience on the ground of historical actors. Um, but that being said, I think that one of the challenging things, but also one of the rewarding things about this, this kind of research is um, it has this very kind of um, straight up Catholic content to it, as you can see in all these images, um, and a very orthodox one at that. I mean, a lot of these images of hell are coming from, you know, Wirix print, prints by the Wirix brothers that in turn are inspired by medieval images. Um, and so the question for me became moving beyond just the surface appearance to look at some of the historical records. Um, so for instance, for the Tupac Amaro chapter, where we have this amazing um, mural program by Escalante. There's not one quipu, there's not one image of an Inca. There's nothing in there that would tell me this is about a rebellion. 
but by virtue of the historical detective work that I was able to do around court testimonies, around the place of Waro in that moment, um, and then the ways that Christian imagery itself can be used in subversive ways, um, that, that was a better, an easier avenue for me to follow in terms of trying to, trying to navigate these questions. But it's, it's a great question. Um, and also, there is a lot of censorship in the early colonial period. Oh, you can't paint the sun, you can't paint the moon, you can't paint the stars, you can't paint mountains. There's, I think it was um, Francisco de Toledo, the viceroy of the, uh, the 1570s, um, pronounced this, but every mural has sun, moon, clouds, stars, and uh, so prescription didn't always equal practice. Kathy. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question, and the question was about textile murals and the various sources. And interestingly enough, all of the textile patterns conform exactly to Spanish liturgical cloths. Um, I did a lot of research in Spain, um, in particular in Barcelona, at the textile um, museum and archive there. And so in terms of the motifs and the weaving techniques, it's almost completely resolutely European. But um, one thing that I was trying to understand, well, it, I get into it a little bit in the chapter, and I think it's going to take too long for me to get through. Well, I'll talk and go through the slides at the same time. Um, is one thing I tried to get at was the technique by which these textile murals were painted. And one thing that I found was at the Church of Caninkunca, you have more of the adoption of a, not stencils, but a very, um, okay, we're almost there. So there's a very systematic way in which these were produced the, in terms of the maintaining the, the, the straight lines and maintaining the motifs across. We know that these were not done with stencil, they were freehand, but my suspicion is that they were actually painted horizontally in way, or painted sort of um, from left to right or from right to left in ways that may have imitated the processes of weaving. Whereas um, the, ch the images at Okongate make me, are, are much more akin to embroidery. So I was trying to think about metaphors um, that are embedded in the practice of the, of the creation of these um, as a way for also thinking a little bit more creatively about how they could have been, you know, what kind of means we can get from them. Interestingly enough, too, um, the textile um, industry was in a major moment of crisis in the 18th century, and local mills, um, textile mills, were also places of major abuses. Um, people were imprisoned in them, and so I, I also wonder about what was happening in the 18th century because these very communities were also the sites of exploitative textile mills. Um, and I wonder, you know, what the perceptions were around these luxurious cloths at a time when, you know, there was all this very turbulent activity going on. I know. <laughs> Someone else can write now. <laughs> Yeah, so I know, and I was actually just in Seville at a conference. I was asking some of my colleagues there the same question. And we do have isolated examples, particularly in smaller areas. So for instance, in niches where a saint would be stationed, you will have some textile designs painted, but never at as large of a scale that we see here. One thing that we do see, though, of course, in the Spanish context and in other European contexts is the interiors of royal palaces are often adorned with actual tapestries and actual cloths. So I think that this was a way of imitating that in a way, in a way that was much more cost effective. It is, it is. And so each case study really challenged me to think about, uh, to come up with different methods for understanding them. Because, you know, for the deck, for the uh, representational murals, there's a very different mode of analysis than looking at these more non representational decorative ones. Thank you.
All right, let's have snacks. There's books for sale. Thank you so much.